very excited to invite you to learn all about my friend, Rochelle. Rochelle is actually a She Recovers coach. I'm just going to pull up the official bio, but she's also a friend. Um, some of you will have met her because she has hosted some of our She Recovers Together online Zoom gatherings. And um, she's also, some of you will have met her on retreat with us. With we were, A bunch of us were on retreat with Rochelle oh. last year. The year before, oh my gosh, I don't even know when it is anymore, Rochelle. Um, last year, 2019. Crazy. And this year. Yes, coming up this year for sure. So let's do the official introduction. Rochelle Davidson is a facilitator, team, and leadership coach by profession. She now finds purpose supporting women in recovery. Certified as a recovery and trauma-informed coach and in recovery herself, Rochelle understands that many women are dealing with their own recovery journeys while navigating personal and collective trauma from current world challenges. Rochelle helps women build recovery capital and create alignment so they can live true to self regardless of the circumstances. A lifelong athlete committed to physical fitness, Rochelle now focuses on holistic well-being and the interconnection between physical, mental, and spiritual health in her own recovery, as well as with her clients. And to learn more about Rochelle and her offerings, please visit rochelledavidson.com. And we'll be sharing the links in the chat and um, in the Facebook Live. Rochelle, thank you again for your patience with all systems not being a go this morning. Oh my uh, gosh, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Don. And yeah, no problem. It happens. Take a breath. It's Monday morning. We're all here together. Yeah. So thank you. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to just put one little thing out there in that um, about the whole idea of recovery capital. So it was a term that was coined back in 1999. So like 20 two years ago. And it was specifically at the time referring to recovery from alcohol and drug use. Okay, so that's the context. And though a lot of the research and data that I'll share this morning are within that context, I'd really love for you to consider the idea of recap recovery capital for supporting your recovery in any aspect. Okay, so including recovery from life, pandemics, grief, loss, codependency, and the list goes on as Don had already shared in the introduction. So we are all recovering from something. So I want this to work for you. Okay. And I'm going to screen or I'm going to share the screen now and we will get going. So this is what we're going to look at this morning. Give a little bit more um, context in terms of my story. Cause as Don mentioned, I am a certified recovery and trauma informed coach and I'm also in recovery. And I think that's important to share. Um, we'll dig a little bit into the evolution of recovery and how others have really laid the way for us in recovery today to own our paths and to design our own unique recovery capital. We will look at what recovery capital is, the various domains of it, um, why it works, like why it matters to your recovery, including how communities like She Recovers can support your recovery. And then we'll look at how to identify and increase your own recovery capital over the course of your own journey. We'll finish it up by answering any questions that you have. All right. So as Don mentioned, uh, I'm a wife. I'm a dog mom, which just a caveat, um, I have an open space office here in my house. And so if you start to hear two dogs barking like crazy, you'll be the first to know that we have squirrels in the yard. All right. Um, I'm a twin sister, I'm a breast cancer beater. I'm a long distance cyclist. I've cycled on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, that's a whole other webinar. Uh, I'm a brewer of kombucha and uh, healthy um, elixirs. I've been a certified professional coach, a formerly executive and leadership coach for over 20 years, credentialed with International Coach Federation. I've worked with organizations such as Lululemon, Arcteryx, Accenture, Deloitte, and I'm in recovery from alcohol use disorder and intergenerational trauma. Alcohol was not part of my upbringing, uh, no history of it in my family, really never had it in the house. I rarely drank in my 20s and my 30s, never looked for alcohol. It came looking for me in my late 30s into my early 40s with the promise to make me more confident, more creative, and able to deal with life, uh, which it did until it didn't. And then my world started to get dark. 
I was still competing as a cyclist, uh, but I was drinking a bottle of wine the night before events, or I'd be showing up hungover to coach spin classes. I was still working as an, an executive coach and a leadership coach, but by then I was working from home and would start drinking wine, which later turned to vodka by noon. I was breaking commitments to myself, my friends, my family. I drove drunk, thankfully never injured anyone. My husband was afraid to come home from work, afraid of which version of Rochelle he'd be getting when he got home. And as you can see, my life was pretty unmanageable. It was definitely unmanageable, not pretty. It was extremely unmanageable. Uh, I stopped drinking when I woke up one night and realized my husband wasn't in bed beside me. And I went downstairs into our basement to find him in one of our storage rooms with a red electrical cord around his neck. So life had gotten really unmanageable for him as well. And that's when I really took on recovery. So thankfully I had the courage, like a lot of you that are here today, um, I had the courage and the support to seek treatment and to take the first steps to what I now know is a lifelong journey of recovery. And my life has been become colorful and bright again. So I've shifted my focus from coaching executives and leadership teams to women seeking recovery, vitality and wellness for themselves. I know from my own experience that addiction and trauma can make us forget who we are. And as a coach, I get to help you remember, which I love. So my mission now, or what gets me out of bed every morning, besides my two hungry dogs, is the opportunity to embolden and equip women to live fully and freely, free from substances, shame and stigma, and free to experience healing joy and meaning in their lives. And I know that every single day counts. So why I'm telling you this is um, what led me to this place is the ability to own my recovery journey to be the author of my story. And I think this is really important um, to, to note. So before we look specifically at what recovery capital is and how you can use it, I want us to look briefly at the realm of recovery and how it's been shifting, which has made room for us to have agency over our paths and to take a strengths-based approach. So there's lots of information on this slide. I don't want you to go through it all. What I'm really wanting you to get from this is that the ability to drive one's own recovery and the idea of multiple pathways of recovery, the level of community and social supports and the idea of recovering out loud, especially for women is a fairly new phenomenon. The fact that we can gather like this today and support each other is due to others who have courageously blazed the way in face of stigma and condemnation, which, which hasn't, which only recently started to go away. So women have been subject to stigma and shame around addiction for hundreds of years. In a really insightful paper titled American Women and Addiction, a Cultural Double Bind by William White and Jean Kilborn, who are two real um, uh, trailblazers in terms of recovery and, and where it's come to, um, we see a paradox-filled history of addiction among women with an ever-increasing menu of psychoactive drugs, including alcohol, aggressively promoted to women with the promises that these products could deliver physical sedation and emotional anesthesia and help us attain what would otherwise be like extremely unachievable standards of beauty. While at the same time, the women who became addicted to these drugs, again, including alcohol, have faced intense shame and stigma. This has gotten better over the decades, and yet it still exists. As a volunteer manager for the She Recovers Together Facebook platform and being witness to most of the posts on there from our 6,000 members, the shame around perception of being weak or a failure from being in addiction is still there. So thank goodness for communities like She Recovers that are continuing to bust through those stigmas. So we've gotten like to, uh, or up to like 11 years ago, we started to expand and look more holistically at recovery in terms of the whole human being and what's needed for recovery. And it's because women like Betty Ford, who opened her senator in 1982 and celebrities like Jane Fonda and Jamie Lee Curtis and Drew Barrymore and others who have had the courage to recover out loud and therefore start to change the narrative 
that's allowed us to get to this term or this type of um, uh, definition around recovery that it's looking at health, home, purpose, community. And this is from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration from 2010. So it's really started to shift. We're really looking at it in terms of a holistic human experience. And it led the way to um, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction in 2015, outlining these principles, which is pretty much where we're at, reflects where we're at today in terms of looking at recovery for both men and women. And these principles are that they are there are many pathways to recovery, many patchworks, many many different ways of approaching it. it requires collaboration, so you can't just do it alone. We know that recovery is a personal journey toward well-being, and I say like a holistic life. It extends beyond the individual, so we'll be talking about the importance of community and social support. So you can't do it alone. It's multidimensional and it does involve everyone. And where this has gotten us is that we've been able to shift from a crisis oriented, professionally directed, like doctor directed or psychiatrist directed acute care approach with an emphasis on discrete treatment episodes to where we're at now, person directed, so recovery directed, recovery management, and it provides long-term supports recognizing the very many pathways to health and wellness and a whole life. And what it also now recognizes is that recovery happens mostly after treatment, which was never seen as the case before. So in the most important role for treatment is to increase participants' recovery capital in preparation for the longer recovery journey in their community. So what's recovery capital? Well, let's look first at what is capital. Uh, I'm not professing to be a financial expert, uh, although I did enter university with the intention of becoming an accountant and I'm super glad that that didn't work out. <laughs> um, although in all fairness to any accountants here this morning or today, I am married to one and he is amazing. <laughs> so recovery capital is like financial capital. So it's like money in the bank for when opportunities and challenges come up in life as they will, like this morning and technology and so many other things. So if we take a look at it as a metaphor, um, like capital that's invested in your home, you want it for the opportunities and challenges that come up. An opportunity like a new hot tub or a home gym, you have the capital to go and invest in something like that. Or the challenges like a leak in your basement or your roof needs fixing, those types of things. It's the same with your recovery capital. You want it for the opportunities and challenges that arise in your life. An opportunity such as you get invited to go on a Mexican vacation, and we will one day get to do that, um, but you get invited on a Mexican vacation with your girlfriends and you have enough recovery capital that you can go and enjoy yourself and not be tempted to drink while you're there. Or the challenges that come up in your life like a job loss or a breakup or any number of things that you have enough recovery capital banked that that doesn't throw you off and throw you into relapse. So specifically, recovery capital, it's your combination of personal, interpersonal and community resources that you can draw on to help initiate and then sustain your recovery. And again, although this is focused on substance addiction, I want you to be able to apply this to anything that you're in recovery for, because it does apply. So again, recovery capital, it's like economic capital. It's measured in surplus. So you wanna be able to bank it, have it there for when you need it. It's gonna look different for each one of us. What I focus on to maintain my recovery and my wellness, it may look different than Dawn's, it's gonna look different than Lisa's, than Taryn's. And why is that? It's because we're all unique human beings with different strengths, different values, different interests. Okay, so it's gonna look different for each one of us and there are standard domains or buckets of recovery capital that apply to most of us. So let's take a look at what those are. One 
bucket or domain is personal capital. And your personal capital is made up of both internal resources, like the things that you can cultivate and external. So it's things like your physical health, that you look after your, your physical health, your well-being, your mental and emotional health, that you have self-awareness, self-esteem, self-efficacy. That's the ability to say no and refuse. Ability to manage life's challenges as they come up, a sense of purpose and meaning, you have optimism and hope. Also includes all your knowledge, your skills, your problem solving, able, you know, able to cope and, and function through life. And then some of the, the, the physical things, the external capital, it's your housing, your personal safety, your income. Another domain is it's called your community capital. And this is around the, you know, the fact that we can't do it alone. So your community capital includes uh, community and cultural attitudes, values, beliefs around addiction and recovery. And the more those are in sync with your own values and attitudes, the, the better able you are to rely on those. It's your access to programs, resources, services. It's your sense of belonging within your various communities. Super important. And then another domain is your social capital. And there's a couple of different buckets within this bucket. So one is your social supports. You have family members who are, um, are supportive of your recovery. You have strong friendships. You have, um, you have loved ones that you can count on and that count on you and other allies that you can, um, that, uh, um, that you can count on. Professional supports. You know, those are the psychologists, the doctors, the social workers, recovery coaches, ministers or pastors that you have those intimate relationships with that are going to support you. And to some degree, like you are, um, you're there for them as well. And then lastly, th the bucket that falls into social capital would be your peer supports, including groups like She Recovers, 12 Steps, including sponsors for 12 Step programs, for Buddhist recovery, smart recovery. And I want to say a, a little bit more about this and the idea of, uh, of peer supports. So, which includes groups like She Recovers. A couple things that I wanted to, to highlight here from various studies. One is the support from a peer recovery group is distinct in its provision of consistent and regular contact with other individuals who share a common goal while learning new coping strategies. Okay, so those are a couple of the benefits of having peer, being within a peer support group. You have common goals, empathy, understanding, oh yeah, we've been there, and able to share and learn coping strategies together. Another study attributed um, peer supports with facilitating behavior change, enhancing motivation for abstinence, connecting people to sober role models, and preventing relapse. I see this all the time as someone who helps to manage the, the She Recovers Facebook group. See this all the time. So a shout out to communities like She Recovers and a spotlight on the importance of peer support groups. So why is all this important? Why are we looking at, at uh, recovery capital in the different domains? Ultimately, recovery capital is the means to developing the skills and capacity to lead a healthy, meaningful, productive life and to prevent relapse. Having sufficient recovery capital helps us create the conditions to focus and develop proficiency in important tasks of recovery. You see some of them, I'm not gonna list them all, but you can see, and I look at this list and go, this is really, these are life skills. These equate to quality of life. It goes beyond recovery to creating the conditions to be a, a well, holistic, healthy human being. So being a functioning human being. We saw some of this in a study, or before we go there, ultimately all of this, these tasks of recovery, 
they want to, or they're there to help us with two things in recovery. One, increased self-efficacy. So that's the confidence in your ability to refuse alcohol or whatever substance or whatever behaviors in the face of adversity or relapse triggers. It's having that confidence. Yeah. So the computer wasn't working this morning, but I got it. I'm calm. I can, I'm able to maintain my, my ground, stay grounded, stay centered and not feel the urge or give in to any cravings that I might have. So that's self-efficacy, being able to count on yourself to refuse. And then the other one basically that we want is we want to be able to increase our self-concept, the beliefs about ourselves and our abilities. And for those of us in recovery, this is a big deal because in our, uh, in our active addiction, a lot of us, or I speak for myself, I lost trust in myself because I had made so many um, uh, promises to myself to stop drinking, that I wouldn't do this, that I, you know, that, that I, that this would be my last day. And I would break my promise to myself and I would break promises to so many other people. But so I started to lose trust in myself. So a lot of what we're doing here and, and using our recovery capital and building up those life skills is so that we increase our um, trust in ourselves. So we are able to count on each or count on ourselves again. It's building up that self integrity, which increases our self concept and allows us to then go into life going, okay, I got this, I can do this. So those are two things that are really important in the realm of recovery capital and what we're wanting to achieve from it. I'm going to skip through this. It's a, a study and just looking at the time, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So um, this just spoke to um, some results from a study in, in around um, recovery capital. I will touch on this real quick. This is, it shows the link between recovery capital, the level of recovery capital and the level of emotional quality of life or even quality of life over time. And you'll see from this, what it says is that the more recovery capital you have and the recovery capital builds over time, the greater increase in your quality of life. So there is a real big correlation between the levels, the amounts, the, the quality of recovery capital in your life and the amount of quality of life over time. This also just goes into the various things that tend to be more important during recovery stages. So we'll get into like that the recovery capital changes over time because different things are important for you during your recovery. During very early stages of recovery, what's most important are being able to develop those refusal skills or that self-efficacy, just de detoxing, um, able to focus on physical health, being grounded there. Whereas way like into long-term recovery might not need, might not need to be focusing on those self-refusal skills every day that that's not as much of an issue as having a spiritual growth, really finding purpose and meaning in life and being able to give back to community. So you see that they, it tends to change over time and where you are in your stage of recovery. So hopefully what you're getting from all of this is that recovery capital supports long-term recovery and your quality of life. It empowers us in recovery to choose and focus on the things that will support us, our well-being, our overall, um, our overall well-being, our overall um, quality of life. And we really do need to focus our attention on recovery. I was listening to a really great podcast last week with Pedram Shoje. He's the author of Urban Monk. He's a um, doctor of, of Eastern medicine. He was a doctor of primary care in the US. Um, and what he said is that we're in an attention economy attention economy. So many things are competing for our attention, <laughs> like social media, other media, apps, Netflix, Amazon, they're all gaming for our attention. It's, and those things are all outside of really what we say is most important for us. And if we aren't focused on what's most important, that which is least important, all those things that I just listed, they're going to take over and it leaks our energy, causes lack of focus, causes lack of direction, lack of discipline. You see that all over right now. People are flustered and not focusing on what's and wondering what to be doing every day. It's time for us to focus. In Chinese medicine, the nature of attention based on the word shen or mind says that our energy or qi follows the mind. So in other words, our 
energy focuses or energy follows what we're focusing on. So are we focusing on the right things? And thankfully, recovery capital helps bring focus to what's most important to us if we're paying attention to it. And that then allows space for and the creation of joy. Because here's the thing, we only have so many heartbeats in our lifetime, we don't know how many. And as humans, we're meant to experience joy. As a coach, I get to work with women and building up their personal recovery capital and therefore reintroducing joy into their lives, which I love. And so in that way, I like to say that I'm a joy breaker, joy broker, not breaker. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not a breaker. I get to be a joy broker. So you might be asking right now, okay, how can I increase my recovery capital? Couple of things here. One, recommend if you're able to, to work with a recovery coach, someone who's trained with recovery capital to do three things. One is to help you assess your current recovery capital. There's a number of ways that you can do that. There's, a, there's at least three different assessments that you can do, use to assess your current recovery capital. And in doing that, you get to identify the areas that are high that you can rely on. Okay, those are the things that are, are already in your wheelhouse, the things that are probably strengths of yours. So keeping those, you also wanna be able to identify the areas that are low that you might be able to build up and then be able to prioritize and select a few, focusing on one or two new different areas or realms at one time. All right, so identifying where your current status is, what you wanna be working on. And then from there, step two would be to define and, and complete specific goals and tasks that are gonna support you. Why we say focusing on just one or two new behaviors or actions at a time is that's really all we can focus on and, and realistically be um, successful at. If we try and take on too many new things at one time, I don't know if you've done it before, but I've tried to do it before taking on, ah, I've got like five goals for this first quarter and it doesn't tend to work. We only have so much um, sponge space to be able to take on new things. So looking at what's gonna be, what's gonna have the biggest impact for my recovery, taking on those one or two things at a time, taking them on with vigor for one to six months, one to three months, and then reevaluate. So that's that third step, reassessing regularly every one to three months. How are those, how are those new areas going? Are they improving? How's your overall recovery capital growing? How's your overall recovery experience for you? What do you need to focus on next? And as I mentioned earlier, your recovery capital is gonna look different as you go along your journey. At the very beginning of, of my recovery and when I was in um, intensive outpatient program, like one of, the, one of my cap pieces of capital was that I had to do urine tests twice a week. And uh, like that was part of the capital that helped keep me from drinking. That's no longer part of my recovery capital. It's not necessary for me now. What's really necessary for me right now, there's a number of things, but one is that I am able to support and give back to the recovery community, which I never would have had the capacity to do at the very beginning. So it shifts. And that's why we want to be reassessing regularly every one to three months. Okay, what's most important right now? What's going on for me now? Some of the nuggets, some of the, the key takeaways that I'd like you to consider are one, you really can thrive. Recovery isn't simply about or only about surviving. And how you thrive is that you get to own your recovery journey. So you have agency over what you focus on, okay, what it means for you. This is strengths based, meaning that you get to focus on what's present in your life that's working and identifying the other aspects that will work for you. There's no shoulds in creating a recovery capital plan. You should do this, you shouldn't do this. It's looking at really what is gonna work for you. 
something I hope that you got out of this is that community and social supports are crucial for, I would say, initial and sustained recovery. We're not meant to do it alone and we don't have to do it alone. We are stronger together. And there's just so much now because so many before us have had the courage to recover out loud, there is just so much more out there for us. Your recovery capital, like I said, is gonna change over time. Over the course of your recovery, it evolves just like you, it transforms just like you. And lastly, what you focus on affects your quality of life. So that's back to the idea of thriving. What are you gonna focus your attention on? I wanna wrap up um, just by, again, I wanna share that this ha doesn't have to be hard. It, 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 it doesn't have to be, um, yeah, it's not something that you do in addition to your life. This is part of your life. It's how you live your life. And um, the more that you take that on as, as something that um, you are doing for you, like Glennon Doyle says, you know, that you're doing it so you can care for yourself fiercely, the, the more you're going to um, enjoy it and find freedom in it. And that's ultimately what I wish for you. And that's what it's given me. It's, it's freedom to live my life. And there we go. That's what I've got. I'm going to stop sharing now. And I think we're going to open it up for some questions. Oh, thank you so much, Rochelle. That was amazing. I love the topic of recovery capital and have enjoyed the recovery capital conferences here on the West Coast the last several years. Um, so, so much there, so much from uh, to talk about the material. But first, I, two things I want to thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's, it's a really important story. It's very personal to you, I know, and to your family. And it just, um, I mean, it just, it just totally touched my heart when I, the first time I heard it and every time since. So thank you for your courage recovering to recover out loud and to share those mm -hmm those moments. Um, also, I want to apologize when I got into the official bio because I was still a little bit flustered from the tech issues. I forgot to say that Rochelle is the coordinator of the admins for our Facebook group, She Recovers Together. And there are some other amazing admins who support her truly. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not up, I'm not gonna name them because I, I'm gonna forget somebody and I don't wanna do that. But uh, just such an amazing group of people. And you, as you might imagine, with seven, over 7,000 members in that group, it can be a pretty full-on job. And these are all volunteers who are just there holding space and helping us to maintain that that space is healthy and thriving. So thank you for your leadership in that role. Um, just it's, it's appreciated so much from all of us. Um, somebody else is also sharing. Thank you. I want you to know how grateful I am for you sharing your story. So let's just see if we've got any questions in the Q&A here. Anybody in the webinar, if you just wanna drop them even in the chat, that would be fine. And um, I'm just waiting to see if there are any questions to come over from Facebook. It usually takes a few moments. And again, we had, for those- Oh, I was say, we, we had one from yesterday that um, popped up and, and if you don't mind me sharing it now and Please, then I can answer sure. it. Um, so Suzanne asked, what was your first indicator of thriving? Uh, where where you knew or felt a sense that it was thriving and was it that moment that kept you from turning back so that's a great question um and i had to think about it for a bit i don't think there was one particular moment but um i knew i was thriving when i felt proud of myself again i wasn't isolating um i was reaching out to people in my life um, I, I was owning my life again. I wasn't making excuses. Um, and there was no energy in trying to stay sober. So like, those are some of the indicators I knew that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm now thriving and it's going to look different for everyone. That's, that's great. I mean, I was kind of reflecting on my own early recovery. It's been 33 years since I started this journey, but I think I, I think when I look back, I knew I was thriving when I felt like I was contributing in, mm -hmm. in the kind of in the recovery community that I was in. I was extremely immersed in a 12 step program for the first number of years in my recovery. And I just remember feeling this sense of pride that, wow, you know what, I'm in charge of sandwiches for the whatever <laughs> it was, you know, like they put me in charge of sandwiches. 
um, and just to be able to kind of, or, you know, when somebody first starts to ask you questions about how you've done something or how did you stop using drugs or how did you get out of that, that unhealthy relationship or mm -hmm. how did you manage to stop being a workaholic? It's, I mean, those are moments where I feel like, okay, I, I must have something here. I've built something up here. I'm, I'm kind of thriving in this community. So, yeah. I also, somebody said, um, Susan Kurtz, interested in learning more about the different phases of recovery. I'll let you go first if you'd like, and then I've always got my own ideas. Yeah, I'm just trying to get to do, 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 do. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, so from all, from all of my reading and, and my research, I mean, there, um, there's different, vocabulary or terminology for it and one i've got here that i've been using that i can share um uh so the recovery stages are uh, initiation early abstinence maintenance and long-term recovery and again like different different doctors and different and different groups will um define it differently but those are you know four that make sense to me and they're based on not just time, but it's also like how what you're experiencing um, yourself in the in the um, in your life. So initiation, it's from pre contemplation. So that's, oh, maybe I think I should stop, but I'm not really committed yet into action, commitment, um, admitting. And that includes like starting detoxification, early stabilization. So, so just getting yourself off of um, off of your drug or alcohol and learning simple refusal skills. So that's right at the very beginning. Early abstinence can be defined as around the first 90 days. Again, it's gonna differ for everyone. It's completion of detox or, or stabilization, starting um, beginning of emotional thawing. Okay, so starting to feel emotions, get familiar again with emotions, early non-chemical coping skills, reintegration with family, developing community peer support network and this early the first 90 days can be the toughest okay because your brain is still addicted to whatever it was that you were addicted to so it can be the toughest maintenance 90 days to five years or sometimes the maintenance can go on indefinitely that's you know continuing to to hone your relapse prevention skills focusing on healthy lifestyle exercise nutrition, then long-term recovery, you know, that could be five years plus, it, it's going to look different again. That is, um, you know, it, it's not every day that you're, um, you're thinking about uh, self-refusal. It's more around mentoring, volunteering, you know, contributing, making those sandwiches, spiritual growth and leadership. Yeah. So you can see like it, it, it shifts. Yeah, I really, I loved the slide actually where you talked about the different stages. I think, you know, I, I feel very similarly that those are the stages. And the, of course, those stages of recovery are built very off the back of the stages of change model, which yes. some of you may or may not be familiar with, which is this theory. It's, it's um, trans theoretical theory of change. And it basically says that, you know, we are where we are when it comes to change. And so uh, we might be in a pre-contemplative stage, which means like we don't really, we're in denial. We, you know, in recovery, we call it denial. We're not actually recognizing there's a problem. So we will, and then we will contemplate it and we'll think, you know what, I do have a problem and we'll think about it for a while, but we won't really do anything about it. Um, and then we start moving in this preparation. We start getting ready. Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to quit or I'm going to leave this relationship or I'm going to stop working so hard down the road and then we move into action and we actually start doing the thing that we want to change we start changing the behavior and then after that we end up in a place where we're, we we're able to maintain that hopefully and sometimes we spiral back and we go back to you know i'm not sure i really have a problem you know, or, or maybe i want to think about how i want to do this what i love and for those of you who are familiar with our youtube channel if you want to go on there there's a beautiful presentation by kathy robbins one of our other amazing she recovers coach that she did specifically on um, the stages of change and what she's introduced is this idea that after we get to maintenance where we stay for a while you know like maintenance means we're we've kind of we're pretty solid in our recovery that the next stage should be celebration and so that we should celebrate this and and i think that for a lot of women in our community who are, are in long-term recovery we're here because we want to celebrate with people who don't know yet we want to show you that 
as hard as it is, and you know, there's no disregarding how difficult it is to make significant changes in your life. But that if you stick with it, you will get to a place where you just love your life. Like you, you won't be able to contain your joy at times and, and life will still be hard and we'll yes. still lose people and we'll still get ill and we'll still have losses in our life. But when it comes to our own kind of self-development and our place and how we feel about our recovery from whatever it is that we're recovering, we will be joyful about that and celebrate it. And we'll want other people to celebrate it too. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Beth shared, um, she actually said that she's she's done pretty well at, I'm um, oh, sorry, about connecting virtually, um, but she's not done so, of course, in person because of the pandemic. And she says, any suggestions? And I just asked if she was in our SRT group. And for anybody who is not in our She Recovers Together group, if you join it, I mean, it's just very, very spontaneous. But I saw just the other day, I saw somebody in San Diego say, hey, I want to get together for coffee. And before you knew it, there was, you know, outdoors for coffee, there was this thread of about eight or 10 women who wanted to see if they can't connect and go for a socially distanced walk or coffee. Um, we do have other groups that are on, she recovers together, sharing circle groups. Um, Rochelle is actually leading one on Zoom right now in Vancouver, I lead one here in Victoria. And what we're moving towards and what everybody in our community will hear, will hear about more over the next several weeks is we're gonna to move to kind of a, a more regional model so that if you are in British Columbia, we'll have one group for everybody in British Columbia. If you're in Ontario, these are Canadian regions, the same. If you're in the Northwest, you Washington State, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, or Wyoming, you'll be in the Northwest and in the Northeast. I think that we're starting with the New England. And then we'll have, you know, every region of North America will be covered off with a She Recovers Together region. And the idea there is just to have a bigger catchment area um, so that people have can, can connect to a region of She Recovers and then still, you know, go for walks locally, have other things happen locally. But so for anybody who's looking to connect, um, when we're allowed to connect safely out of outdoors, of course, I think it, just stick with us. We've got some other things going on. We've got right now, we've got a Google spreadsheet. We've got a new form we're gonna be introducing where people can just put, if you wanna meet other people in your area, you put your name and where you're from, and then you'll be able to see and sort through um, who else might be in your area. But um, I would say the She Recovers Together Facebook group is really the best place to make connections with people in your, in your kind of um, in-person area. Somebody else had a great question here. Let me just see what I can do. Um, what did you replace in your case, Rochelle, alcohol with in the beginning? Did you have to replace it with something? Um, I didn't have to replace it with like as in a, a different kind of beverage. No. Um, um, I started drinking more kombucha, which is a non-alcoholic fermented drink that is very good for digestion and immune system. I, I now brew it. Um, so, but I wouldn't say I, I replaced it with that. What I did replace were, um, my, my rituals. So I would have a ritual of making dinner and having a glass of wine, which would turn into two, which would turn into three. Um, so I just started shifting those, the, the ritual. So taking the you know, taking the, the drink right out of it. And instead of, of picking up a glass and drinking while I was making dinner, I would do like a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle. So that would keep me going as well. So just completely changing the patterns um, instead of, you know, Friday night, um, you know, having wine and watching, um, you know, my favorite TV show, I would go for a walk instead, or, you know, we've started, I started painting rocks. Um, so just completely replacing the behaviors with something else creating new rituals. Great. And again, you know, we see a lot of women in our community talk about one of the new rituals that they're engaging in, in their early recovery is connecting with our Zoom gatherings. Mm -hmm. You know, and for, you know, many people, it's kind of, it's in the evening or it's even in the, their witching hour. And so instead of doing what they would normally do, they, they get online and, and, you know, listen to. Absolutely. 80, 90, 100 other women talk about what's going on for them in that moment. Um, somebody else is, is, is sharing that she has been trying to get sober for over six years and she typically goes about three to six months without drinking and then starts drinking again for a period of a week to a few months before stopping again. Um, the amount she drinks and how long it lasts for has decreased over time. So I see this is improvement. Yes, this is improvement, I will just say. 
Um, but sometimes I doubt if I'm capable of ever completely quitting. I wonder, I'm wondering what your take on this is in terms of the stages. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, but yeah, and again, that is a big step for, you know, that your level is going down. That is huge. So I hope you can acknowledge yourself for that. Um, and, you know, as, as a coach, I would be curious to know, like, are, like, do you really want to quit altogether? Is that something that is, is a, a goal for you? Um, cause sometimes we say something and it comes from a place of should versus want to. So I would ask, you know, and just to be honest, like, is this something that I think I should do, or is it something that I really, really want to do? Um, and if it's something that you really, really want to do, then, um, yeah, to start to look at, you know, that you hit that three to, I think you said three to six months, you hit that three to six months and then you start drinking again. Um, what are the triggers that have you start to drink again? Um, you know, and, and when you start to drink, what level, you know, commitment level one to 10, where are you in terms of um, like how important this is for you? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd recommend starting to work on building up that self-efficacy, that those um, that refusal self-efficacy. So when things come your way, that three to six months that you have the those resources, that recovery capital to draw on that allows you to choose no instead of choosing yes to the alcohol. In terms of the stages of change, um, um, yeah, it could be at pre-contemplative to contemplative right now. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I would just add that sometimes I hear women share about the, you know, I, I'm never going to be able to do this or I'm not sure if I can ever do this. And I just always want to say it, you could, you can, yeah. but I think your, your, um, your questions are great. You know, maybe, maybe so rather than look, and this is like the stages of change thing. I love the stages of change. I could talk about them all the time, but if, if abstinence isn't somebody's goal, like if you're really, it isn't abstinence that you want to do, then you can still start on recovery and you can just say, you know, you can contemplate cutting down and then gauge your success by doing that. Right. Um, so I just do think it is like, what is your, what is your desired outcome? And, and maybe your desired outcome doesn't have to be the ultimate outcome. We are so used to thinking that, especially with substances, that abstinence is the only way and the most desired way. And in my own recovery, personally, it is the only way for me. I did plenty of harm reduction and, and trying to figure out whether I could do it any other way. And I can't, that doesn't mean that I get to say that that's true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So thank you for that question. Somebody sharing that she has much admiration for women who recover out loud. And she has a desire to serve her own small local community in that way, because she knows that there are people who are who struggled like she did. At this point in her story, she was a closet drinker and mostly a closet recoverer. If you have any suggestions for a recoverer who wants to move out of the closet in a way that still supports her recovery. Hmm. Well, congratulations for being on your journey and, and for, you know, wanting to step your toes out of the, the recovery closet. I love that. I like, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's just, you know, having, finding what works for you, um, you know, starting to recover out loud with those that you trust the most that have your back that, um, you know, are there for you, um, you know, so you have that, you know, that you're going to be accepted and loved um, and start to go from there, like build your confidence from there. I, I you know, I, I, you know, I, I didn't jump from the rooftops and like, Hey, um, like I, I, you know, and I'm still selective with who I share my story with. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I share it with people that I, I know um, have my back and um, where I'm going to be accepted. So for, for you to, you know, and you know who those people are and, um, you know, start to, to do that. And, and if you're wanting to, you know, practice recovering out loud, she recovers is like the, the place to do it in so many ways. Um, Thanks, Rochelle. I would suggest as well, maybe think about if, is there somebody in your small local community who you can let know that you're in recovery? Should anybody need to talk to somebody about recovery? Like mm -hmm. maybe a, a physician or a social worker or kind of some somebody that's in the helping profession who might on a regular basis run into women who are struggling. And if you know, if you give that person permission 
for that person struggling to reach out to you. That might be a way of just kind of putting yourself out there a little bit in the community without actually having to do a, a parade or an announcement or, or whatever it is that you might want to do. But, um, you know, our, our intention reads very specifically when we are ready, we recover out loud so that women who are struggling can find and join our movement and, and that when we are ready. Um, and I think, you know, it's like a stage of change. You're ready to start thinking about how you're going to do this. And there's no, there's no deadline on it. You can do it as you feel comfortable. Yep. Okay, here's a great question. And just so you know, we are going over because we were late getting on. How do we know when we are allowed to celebrate? In other words, what do we do with that voice that says relapse can always happen? Beware. Oh, I love that. For me, it's a both and. Hey, I'm celebrating and acknowledging where I'm at today and who I am today. And yes, I know that that relapse is a possibility. I just hold on to both. And it's, it's actually a very helpful tension for me to have that, that it's not, I can celebrate and, and that allows me to uh, be here today doing what I'm doing. It allows me to, um, to contribute and to coach and to, um, and to have joy in my life. And it also holds me accountable. I can't ever get lazy or complacent or, you know, let that recovery capital go down because I know it's always a possibility. So I very much appreciate the and of it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think I love that, Rochelle. And and I think I, I agree. Um, how I would what I would say about this is. Uh, over time, like over time, I, I don't, you know, I remain the way I, the way I recover changes. So I guess I would say that I'm, I've been allowed to celebrate for quite a long time now. Um, but I will always remain vigilant in my recovery, but not afraid that I'm going to relapse if you know, there's kind of a slight difference there, right? Like I know, um, I don't know, actually, I, I guess if I just fell into a place where I was stopped being honest with myself, and if I started hanging out with people who were doing dishonest things or unhealthy things all the time, and if I was um, filled with regret, like if I was just in a mental space, and then surrounding myself with other people, and maybe there is a possibility that I would think that using drugs was an option again in my life after 30 some years, but, but I don't do any of those things. So I think that, you know, I think learning how to celebrate regardless of how long it is. I, I don't think it, I don't think you have to give up your vigilance or your commitment to your recovery. I think as long as you keep that, as long as you keep that, um, I think it's when you throw everything that you've been doing away that you might want to, um, then the, the, the voice of relapse can always happen, might get louder, but, but I don't know. I think it's very personal too. If you're a person who, um, and I know there are a lot of people who in 12 step programs in particular, kind of, they have a fear and some say a healthy fear of relapse. And that's what keeps them propelled going forward. And if that's, what's working for you, that's who am I to say that, that you can't, you know, you can't have that healthy fear. Um, we don't tell people how to recover. So great questions. Okay. Um, okay. I live in a small town and there's not support other than AA and would like a broader scope. This has been a great presentation. I appreciate it. I will check out. Please do join us online. So if you get into our Facebook group, all the information about our two meetings per day are on there. And um, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of women who are in 12 step recovery and who are not. And we, as I said at the beginning, you know, we support all pathways and we criticize none. Um, how do you deal with guilt? Oh, from the choices you made during drinking, therefore hurting your loved ones. I've always pushed all feelings down with drinking and now they are rising. I'm not sure how to deal with them. You're not alone. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, how I, I dealt with the, the guilt and, and shame of my behaviors and how I treated people and let them down was... Um, to have the, the courage to, um, to make amends, to ask forgiveness. Um, because the, you know, the, what I'd done was already out there. There's no taking it back. And, um, 
to get complete with myself and, and with the people in my life that mean so much to me that I'd hurt. Um, it was, it was really about asking for forgiveness and, you know, in every single case, that's all they wanted as well. So it was, you know, it's the, it's the making amends it's um, and, and owning. So first of all, it, 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 I couldn't have done that until I owned my, um, owned my behaviors and the consequences of them. And to know like it was, it was, it was part of the, of my disease. Um, and as Don says, like, we're not the shit we did and really taking that on. We're not the shit we did. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And as we change our behavior, it, it gets easier. You know, here's what I used to say. Like if after a workaholic binge or after a substance binge or whatever, you know how you've the first day after the, the morning after you just it's you're just like this right all day long and then by the end of the day you're kind of like this and by the next day you kind of come out of that shame like the the deep deep dark shame and it, the same is true of all the stuff that you've piled up behind you the longer you stay in recovery and change your behavior the longer you aren't doing those things it's the same way you start feeling like okay i've got some distance from that um in recovery, in self-reflection, in therapy, in trauma work, in all the things that we do, we come to understand why we did the things we did. And as Rochelle said, I always say, you know, the shit you did is just the shit you did. It's not who you are. And it never was. And so it just, self-forgiveness is such an important part of recovery. And it's something that we all work really hard on. Um, but first we stop doing the things we did. First, you know, first I always say step one, stop the behavior. So you don't keep piling onto it, right? Um, but yeah, you, you will get there. I, pr I promise you. And I make a lot of promises about recovery, but I think I can back them up, not only through my own experience, but through observing women in recovery and making women in recovery my obsession for the past many years. Where do, this is a good one. Where do I find the line of being stubborn and just letting my journey unfold naturally? So sometimes some of the recovery tools feel forced on me and then I feel shame. I've been sober a long time, but still struggle with the shoulds. Ooh. Uh, I'd love to hear an example. Um, so being stubborn versus. Hmm. I think it's, it's maybe, maybe she's saying it's from Facebook, so I'm not sure. Um, so I, I would say if some of the recoveries, maybe somebody's trying to, maybe, maybe it's like a 12 step thing. Like when do you just let your journey unfold and do what feels right for you mm -hmm. versus being told what to do. And I don't mean that that's just 12 step, but maybe somebody's telling you in your family, you need to do this and you need to do that. And you're feeling like, yeah, I don't know that I need to do that. Hmm. There's two answers to that question. There's two answers. Well, one, yeah, I mean, yeah. As a coach, sometimes like I would say, well, go try it on and see if it works for you and you know you might surprise yourself and go oh okay yeah it does actually work for me or you might try it on and go oh yeah no it doesn't and then it's not even a should you're able to to set a boundary and go yeah i tried this and it, and it didn't it didn't work um so i'm always an advocate for, advocate for like just trying it on and see you, you might surprise yourself um and uh yeah in the you know and then with respect to the do I, you know, can I just let it unfold naturally? Absolutely, sure. And um, always being aware of how much recovery capital you have, even when you're, you know, sober for a long time, do you have the recovery capital that's allowing you that quality of life that you, that you want? So that you're focusing on the things that, that nourish you, that fulfill you. And, um, you know, unfolding naturally doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't being intentional and being focused at the same time. Was that anywhere in terms of what you said in the two answers, Don? <laughs> That's exactly, I was, yeah, I mean, I think that unfolding naturally, I like, I prefer to think of it as um, creating your own patchwork, mm -hmm. right? So maybe like taking less, less external, direction um and and just you know like feeling what feels more natural for you and doing it that way mm -hmm. but i would say the same you know kind of your second point too it's just like but are you healthy and well like is is what you're doing working are you 
you know, are you, are you on your journey or have you like stopped? And um, I, I, you know, I actually do encourage, there are people in recovery who I think like, we do get to have a break from working our ass off on our recovery. And I think like, we must do that. It doesn't necessarily mean in the first 90 days or the first six months or the first year or whatever. But um, I do think that journey is a, is a practice, right? I'm writing a book called that. So um, I think that we always have to be practicing and doing it. Yeah. Here's, a, I think our last question is kind of a similar one. So this is, um, what if you fall back into unhealthy behaviors, not relapse in the later years of recovering? So she's, and then comment, managing the dry drunk and making amends. What if you fall back? So. So falling back, yeah. Um, going back to the Pedram Shoje, he uses a really great analogy of the garden of life. And, you know, he says like, if your garden, if your life were, if you could have five um, plants in your garden that represented the things that were most important for your life, what would those be? And how much water they, do they need? And your, the water is your, your resources, it's your time, it's your energy, it's your money. So how much water, how much resources do those things that you say are most important for you, how much water do they need and how much are you giving it? And on the flip side, what are the weeds that are starting to come through and grow in the garden? And what, what weeds are you growing, right? What weeds are you watering that are taking away those precious resources from the plants that you say are most important? So if you find yourself slipping, you know, I would ask for you to, to reflect on, so what are you paying attention to right now? What are the plants that you're watering in your life? If it's your family, if it's your career, if it's your health, it's whatever. And what are the weeds that might be percolating? The social media, the Netflix, whatever it is, the, you know, the blaming um, that you're allowing to, uh, to take over the garden. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you, Rochelle. You got to love great. Pedram Shoje. <laughs> love it. Um, the one final question, just because I, I um, somebody said this is very personal, but I know the answer, so I know you're happy to share it. Um, somebody asked, "Is your husband okay?" I don't think oh, you you kind of yeah. turned didn't quite finalize that part of the story. He's he is very well. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yes, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a turning point for both of us. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, I just really want to thank you, Michelle. It was an incredible, incredible um, presentation. And thank you for, for doing it with us. And um, for those of you who haven't met Rochelle, you can meet her. I, she hosts. I don't know when you're hosting again. Thursday, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Wonderful. So you can meet her there. Um, we've also shared her um, website. So you can consult with, you can kind of check in with her if you're interested in learning more about any of her coaching programs or services. And um, yeah, I and, just really and if I could just sorry, if I can just add yeah. one thing, if, if you're interested in doing an assessment of your own recovery capital, I, I mentioned that there's a number of different tools, just drop me a line through my website, and I'll connect you with that. Wonderful. Great. Well, it's a great topic. And I appreciate you bringing it to us today and laying it out there in a way that's really easy to grasp and understand. And um, so thank you. My pleasure. And for everybody else who's been here, thank you for, thank you to Lisa and Taryn on the back end. Um, everyone's just saying how wonderful this was, how fabulous you are and how empowering this was. So thanks again. Wonderful. And for the rest of you, please know that we do have two meetings a day. We'd love to have you there. Just join us in our Facebook group to get information, or you can go online to She Recovers Together online on our Facebook. You might be able to get through us to us through that way. Um, what else do I want to say? Just that next Monday, I, darn it, I don't know what we're talking about next Monday. I always <laughs> seem to be able to know, but we are here every Monday, normally at 9 a.m. Pacific noon on the nose. We were late this morning because of my computer not waking up. Um, and we also have Taryn, my daughter and co-founder of She Recovers Teaches. In this time slot, She Recovers Trauma-Informed Yoga. Um, on its on a different link, but in this time it's also free. And on Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, Peyton leads She Recovers Dance. So um, please do visit our website. And if you are inclined to um, make a donation, we are a nonprofit charity, and every dollar helps. So thank you very much, everybody. And Rochelle, thanks again. Thank you.